So yeah, so the question is around stem cell transplant. Stem cell transplant is certainly a major commitment by the patient. Uh, it's a major commitment of, of financial resources, uh, human resources, uh, and insofar as there are approaches and therapies that, that can uh, obviate the need for stem cell transplant, that's, that's, that's a better solution. Clearly there are patients who fail other therapies and stem cell transplantation can be truly life life saving and life prolonging. So that's an area where we're again working at the medical policy level, working with our clinical organizations to determine um, what alternatives there are before stem cell transplantation, but then there's the, the issue of you don't want to go down the, the pathway of, of salvage chemotherapies or even sal salvage immunotherapies that, that have no value and then the patient is getting sicker uh, and, and stem cell transplantation becomes more difficult, more problematic, higher probability of, of infection or bad outcomes. So weighing those, it is a, a very much a delicate balance. So, so we have uh, explicit medical policies that are publicly available and if any of our listeners, viewers would want to review those, they are, they are a matter of public record. Um, I can't today uh, comment on how we specifically uh, have our coverage policy for particular infused therapies for CLL versus oral therapies. Again, th that information is available. We do mostly rely, again, on our clinical organizations to make informed and evidence-based decisions about which pathway to follow, which alternative to use. And so those, those are the kinds of decisions, very, very important decisions, but we really see those in the domain and the province of clinicians, uh, medical oncologists, surgical oncologists where surgeons are involved, radiation oncologists, uh, the, really the true care team, um, comprehensive cancer care. Uh, again, we, we, we provide certain framework around, around medical policy if there's insufficient evidence to support the use of something, we may have a, a medical policy that states that. Uh, in this group of competing therapies that were mentioned uh, in, the, in the area of, of CLL, infused therapies versus oral therapies, again, uh, with, with those all being in the armamentarium, we're really gonna look to our clinical partners to make those decisions. So the question about uh, intravenous IV therapy, uh, infused therapy versus oral, where oral therapies are, are available and equally or more efficacious. Again, they offer uh, certain advantages in terms of uh, the ability of the patient to control his or her uh, taking of a medicine as opposed to having to have an appointment at an infusion center, uh, th things like that. So there, there, there are certain um, um, obvious advantages to oral therapies. Um, on the other hand, um, if, if, the, uh, if the infused therapy offers uh, 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 advantages in, in survival or, or, or other, other advantages around uh, um, knowing that the patient is getting uh, the precise therapy that, that is needed in a particular uh, dosing uh, uh, scheme, then, then that might uh, trump the um, the uh, oral therapy. As far as the cost, uh, I, I really can't uh, comment because that, that, that gets into a lot of different considerations about what uh, the patient cost burden might be in one, one of our particular plan designs versus another plan design. Um, more often you are going to have somewhat higher patient out-of-pocket cost when you go to a facility than if, you're, than if you're picking up a medicine. But if the medicine is considered a specialty pharmacy product and might have a higher co-payment or even a co-insurance, uh, then it's possible that it could be less expensive for the patient to, to get an infused product. So th th those kind of things are, are very, uh, there, there's, I can't give you a one-size-fits-all answer to that one.